a grave mistack. I felt nervous as I entered through the gates of the old graveyard. Every year my best friend and I would come and spend the night hoping to contact the dead. We usually try for family members that have long passed away or dead celebrities nothing to really write home about. This year was going to be different. I was hoping to contact the infamous serial killer Ted Bundy. Before you make judgments let me explain why. You see I had a paper due for my criminal history class on the inner working of the mind of a serial killer. But because he is long dead I thought just maybe I would be able to channel him. Again don't judge me this paper is worth half of my grade. Missy my best friend since preschool agreed to go with me even though this year I was attempting something very reckless. Well maybe I begged her. But can you blame me? There was no way in hell I was going to do this on my own and risk being savagely murdered by the ghost of a serial killer or anyone else who could be lurking in here. This graveyard has been abandoned since the 1800s no one really knows why. There are a few legends attached to land here. But there is no way to find if there is any truth or merely stories used to scare young children. As we passed the old dilapidated gravestones I had the feeling that something was watching me. I shivered and grabbed for Missy's hand. She just laughed at me and shook her head. Honestly Emily why do you like coming here if it creeps you out? Because unlike the other graveyards in town this one is not guarded. The cops won't come within five miles of here and neither will anyone else in town. You know what else that means. She glanced around as if she was looking for something. If we get brutally attacked by a mental patient there will be no one to save us. We will be left here to die. That was not helping the way I was feeling in any way in fact it made it worse. Every noise was getting to me. As the wind blew the though this unearthly place I could swear I heard someone whisper my name. I could feel ice cold breath on the back of my neck which caused all the hairs to stand up and the sick feeling intensified. The smell of old death wafted through the air and the trees looked as if they were about to reach out to grab you. By the time we reached the mausoleum that was located in the far corner of the graveyard I was starting to reconsider my decision. The building was here even before this place was used to bury the dead. Instead of tearing down the building they left it for the select few that were willing to pay the extra money to have their loved ones safely locked away from grave robbers. Of course all the chains that were used were now rusted away making it very easy for use to get in. This is where we would be spending the night. The door was heavy, it took both of us to open it. As we slid the big stone door our lungs we assaulted by decades of dust. I reached in my pocket and pulled out my puffer as my lungs begged for air. Missy looked at me with concern. I could tell that she was also having second thoughts about our little adventure. The room was very cold and dark but it was much better than spending the night outside. Okay let's get set up. I opened my bag and pulled out six black candles as well as chalk and a box of salt. Missy looked at me like she expected me to pull a bat or a sacrificial virgin out of my bag. Do you actually know how to use all this stuff? I mean I thought we were going to use a spirit board or something. The board isn't always accurate, you never know who you are talking to. If we do this right Ted Bundy's spirit should materialize right in front of us. He can't hurt us but we will be able to see him. I know this is beyond crazy but if this works imagine the possibilities. Plus I also brought a tap recorder so we can get voice evidence. This one is top of the line it picks up EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon, plus we can record our voices as well. So I thought of everything, but enough talking let's start setting up shall we? Missy looked at me like she had no idea what I was talking about. Sometimes I forgot the only reason why she was here was to be a supportive friend and not because she enjoyed it as much as I did. It was the same every year here and I would come to this place and play with the Ouija board then she would have nightmares for a week. I handed the recorder to her so that she could see how it worked as I explained it. Okay you know how a normal tape recorder if turned on would record the conversation that we are having now, but you would only hear our voices. Well an EVP picks up on white noise or ghosts, if Bundy comes through tonight this will allow us to hear the answers that he gave us. 
It's what paranormal investors use as proof of the supernatural. It also will let me go back and take notes later so that I don't miss anything. Oh, I get it. I could tell that I had totally lost her which was okay. I would take the time to explain more in detail once we were back home. I took us about half an hour to set up and once we were finished the room like something out of Rob Zombie movie. Now that the room was fully lit I could clearly see the coffins that were lined up by the back wall. But unlike those that were outside in the elements these were in much better condition. I tried to concentrate on the task at hand and not how creepy the room was. Missy on the other hand was silently praying to herself as she began to place the candles in a big circle around the room. I instructed her to light the candles as I began to lay salt in a large circle around the candles as I worked Missy and I said a prayer of protection. This is my shield is my power of protection against evil. This shield keeps me from harm. This shield does not allow demons or negative entities to pass through it. This shield is my domain and I alone determine what is allowed to pass through it. No dark entities shall pass through my shield. As I will, so mote it be. Wiccan Protection Spell I took a deep breath as I prepared for the second part. I really wanted this to work but at the same time I was terrified. We were playing with things that we didn't understand. What if we unleashed something horribly wicked on the world? I looked over at my best friend. She smiled at me weakly I could tell that she was afraid as well. Are you ready? I pulled a dagger out of my bag. I had done a lot of research and blood and pain are the key factors in summoning a serial killer or a dark entity. Yep. She squeaked moving closer to me. I took the dagger and drug it across my palm. I cried in pain as the blood dripped from my hand onto the cold dirt floor. Ted Bundy hear these words, hear my cry. Spurt from the other side. Come to me. I summon thee. Cross now the great divide. Nothing happened, Missy and I sat there for the longest time in awkward silence waiting or anything at all to happen. Maybe we need to try again? Missy whispered as if she was scared something or something might hear her. I looked at my hand it was barely bleeding by now. The thought of cutting myself again made me sick to my stomach. Once again I sliced the dagger across my palm. A little deep this time and Missy and I both said the words this time much louder than the first time. The blood poured out of my hand. I was starting to feel light-headed. Ted Bundy hear these words, hear my cry. Spurt from the other side. Come to me, I summon thee. Cross now the great divide. The wind picked up all the salt that was meant to keep us safe was gone, and all of the candles blown out. I quickly wrapped up my hand and relight the candle. Missy was nowhere to buy found the spot that she was sitting was no covered in blood. I could hear screams coming from outside I knew that I had to find my friend and get out of here. At this point I had no idea who or what we had summoned, but whatever it was it was powerful enough to cause serious physical harm. As I tried to get up from my sitting position I felt wound on hand once again start to bleed profusely as I put pressure on it. I cried out and fell back on the ground. If I didn't get up I was going to bleed out right there on the floor of the mausoleum. I screamed out in anger as I pulled myself to my feet once again. I knew I had to stop the bleeding. I reached into my bag and pulled out the first aid kit. I had never went anywhere without it. It constantly came in handy since Missy and I were always hiking or mountain biking. I grabbed a bandage and quickly wrapped my hand. I pulled it so tight that my fingers went numb but the bleeding had stoked. There was a good chance that my friend was already dead but taking care of my wound took much longer than I would have liked it to. I grabbed my bag and flashlight and headed outside. There was no sign of Missy or the thing that took her. The graveyard was dead silent the only thing that I could hear was the racing of my own heart. Missy. Where are you Missy? I hollered so loud my throat went hoarse. I listened for a long time but there was nothing. Please answer me. I whimpered through my tears. Emily, I see you Emily. Murmured a disembodied voice. 
but it wasn't female. The voice that was coming directly behind me was male. I slowly turned around and there covered in blood was a vile-looking creature with Missy's head in his hands. It was at this moment I realized what we had done, how stupid was I to think that we could summon a serial that was dead for 36 years. I tried to run but I was strangely hypnotized by the demon. What are you? I finally managed to choke out still looking at my friend's severed head. My child since it was you who shed your own blood not once but twice to release me I will tell you. But first let me explain why I came in the place of the man you summoned. I am what darkened this man's soul. I am the reason why he was able to take so many lives without mercy. I am Andres, the little voice in Bundy's head, the poor man was merely a puppet a plaything. Missy was going to be my next vessel but sadly when I tried to take over her body things got messy as you can plainly see. So I thought I might as well keep a trophy, you on the other hand are strong my child I don't wish to kill you I wish to borrow your body as it were. And if I refuse? I glared at the demon thinking, I am not sure why I thought I could frighten this thing away. I wasn't going to give up my body without a fight, it would have to kill me before I gave up my soul. Andres threw back his head and laughed. Silly child you think that am I giving you a choice, do you really think that you can defeat me? He grabbed me and forced me to look eyes as they went from black to crimson red and back to black I felt my body go into a sleep-like state and then I heard the words. We will become one body, one mind, one soul. I'd be there always, every life you take will be of my doing. But the blood will be on your hands, Missy's blood will be. On your hands? Now wake my child, wake the daylight is quickly approaching. I was very groggy like I had awoken from a very long nightmare but when I rolled over to pull myself up Missy's head was staring at me. I know that I should have been horrified at the very sight of my dead friend staring at me with her cold dead eyes. But I felt absolutely nothing at all, in fact I kicked the head around a little until I found an empty grave. She shoots she scores. I screamed as I kicked the head into the empty grave, then I went to gather my belongings and headed home. Over the next few months there were television and newspaper reports of a possible serial killer on the loose. Over 12 men and women had gone missing in four different states and the number was rising. The police were baffled and no closer to catching the person responsible. I got an A-plus on my paper. My teacher was very impressed on my insights into the mind of a serial killer. In fact she told me that I should think about a career in behavioral profiling and you know what I just might do that after all to catch a serial killer you have to be one, I mean think like one. The End Our sickness. It shouldn't have happened to me. I never expected to perish so suddenly. I don't think anyone does, but it still stings. I was in good enough health. I thought I could get past anything that I got. But that's the thing about this sickness. It sneaks up and hits you. I didn't think I had it. I thought it was something else at first. Before I could worry too much, it hit me. I was completely wiped out. I couldn't think straight, or even breathe right. It felt like my life was draining away. I went to the hospital, but it was too late. I died there, separated from my family and friends. They couldn't see me, afraid they'd grow ill. When they learned I was gone, they wept shamelessly. I saw it all, even when I had died. That's another thing about this sickness, or perhaps life in general. Both leave you hanging if you go before your time. I couldn't leave this world anymore. Its forces refused to let me pass. Now I'm stuck here, forced to watch the aftermath of my death. 
That hurts me, even more than my passing. This is my first year as a ghost. It's not even a full year here. Halloween's coming up soon. I became this way only a few months ago. I remember it clearly, given the circumstances. It was summer's start, in the second week of June. What I've seen since then makes me sick. It shouldn't be this bad. I thought we could get past this sickness. That'd make my death tolerable, knowing that everything could be normal. But it hasn't been. Things have only gotten worse. This hit us all under our noses. So many are as I am. We're trapped on a cruel, ruined world. Others gamble with their lives, just like I did. Apparently, I wasn't careful enough. I was too optimistic about this situation. My faith couldn't protect me. I see others walk about without any concerns. They don't know what awaits them, be it on earth or elsewhere. I look out at them. I envy their innocence. I was like them only months ago. Despite all that happened, I had hope for the future. It was my future, free from this madness. But even that was stolen away. I exist with a great many, our lives taken from us suddenly. I have no future anymore. All I am is a figment of my past self. I'm trapped on this earth, unable to do anything about it. I have to watch life pass me by. Our kind travel the land, lamenting our fate. I see so many who become like us. I doubt that they can be saved. I can't even get mad at them. No amount of anger will show them the truth. They need to experience it for themselves. Some of them might get sick either way. At least they'll know my pain. It's the pain of too many now. So many are like me, gone before our time. We had our lives to live, recovering from our chaos. But we can't even have that. All we own is our spirits now. We slip within society, watching the world crumble further. All is beyond our power. We're punished for the faults of society. For some, they are our own. We can only watch the world fall to illness. Many join our ranks with each day. We are forced into silence. While it hurts me, I can't help but think about this. Is this humanity's punishment? Have we grown too insolent for this world? Will our pride be our downfall? I'm not sure yet. None of us can, be we alive or not. But it seems like things are growing worse. As winter approaches, they'll be more like us. They'll know our misery, unable to tell any others. That's the cruelest joke of all. To know truth, one must be forced into it. That's what this sickness does to people. It blindsides them, leaving them vulnerable. Once it strikes, they're at its mercy. I question its perspective sometimes. When it has run its course, what will the world become? Was it really worth the trouble behind it? I don't think it is. But I can't speak for this sickness or fate itself. The world has been terrorized by plagues before. Humanity managed to recover from them. That's well and good, but it doesn't help me. It doesn't help those who've died already. We're doomed. We must roam the world, watching it ruin itself again. Halloween is a time for terror and thrills. I'm short on the latter, but know the former well. I see it whenever I pass by many others. We are fearful, dreading this awful illness. We fear for our world's fragile future. I have none, but so many others do. We inhabit the same world, one torn by sickness, shame, and spite. My own being haunts me now. I know others can't sense me, much less see me. Some of them fear the ailment's effects. They dread their coming deaths. Those are reasonable things to fear. Even they haunted me so long ago. However, I fear for their fate. Some among them will join me this season. We'll spend our Halloween as one, creeping about the world. We'll be bound by our deaths, how needless they were. 
Most of this was needless in hindsight. We should have taken this chaos more seriously. So many lives would have been spared. Even my own may have slipped by. I'd be spared this torment. I don't know why it has to be like this. It shouldn't have happened to me. I wanted to own my past life. I thought I had more time left. Then again I know the truth behind my negligence. It stole that from me and so many others. That's the worst part of it all. We were punished for our lack of foresight. In a way, so is the rest of the world. However, we got the worst of it. That sickness strained us completely. We couldn't fight against it until our time was over. Afterwards, we had died, turning us into mere spirits. We didn't know what awaited us then. It sickens us to know the truth behind our fates. This sickness doesn't care about its path of ruin. It only reaps more souls into our purgatory. We're all trapped in an unforgiving world. The only difference is that we cannot touch it anymore. We wait on the sidelines, suffering away. There's no escape. This season is grim, even more than possible. My fellow spirits join me, bound by regret. Many of us fill the streets, our forms unseen. We range from the young and old, the rich and poor. No one can escape our fate. It wounds us, adding to the world's rising despair. Our world is well on the way to collapse. If this keeps going, spirits will infest every part of it. We will linger on, having inherited mankind's misery. Perhaps we'll leave when the world comes to its senses. I doubt that will come easily, though. Chaos runs freely now. Humanity can hardly contain and sustain itself. I fear for the world, those who'll enter our ranks. They're coming alongside the changing times. This shouldn't have happened. Humanity shouldn't suffer for the ignorance of some. I guess this was the tipping point. The world had to answer for its pride someday. It's scarier than any other festive fright. However, it always felt distant. It could be dealt with later. The time for judgment has come. I must accept it in death. I just never expected to die alongside humanity itself. The End The Tale of Wasper John How long are we gonna stay in this godforsaken cemetery? Ron asked Max. All night if we have to. Max spit a thick was of tobacco out of his mouth. We're not leaving until we find John Morris' stash. Are you sure it's even here? Ron seemed defeated already. Look if you don't want to help me dig then leave and I'll keep the money. Max was already tired of his nagging questions. He wouldn't have even brought him if the money wasn't buried in one of these graves. John Morris was an old mining prospector who struck it big when he fell into a sinkhole that had huge veins of gold stretching for thousands of feet. He extracted all of it and bought himself a mansion in this forest. Many stories have arisen about his behavior after he found that shaft and built the mansion. Tales of the Occult and Midnight Rituals some said he sacrificed goats and sometimes humans. What was no for sure was he had started a following, a cult, which lived in the mansion with him. After he died the cult all went away, but none of them took anything with them. All of his money was in gold bars and he had it buried with him when he died. What about the curse? Ron seemed frightened. What of it? Max laid his tools beside the gate into the cemetery. Well, I don't want to die. Especially the way the old man died. Ron whispered as Max tore away the chains to the gate with his cutters. You actually believe that mumbo-jumbo? 
Max spat at Ron's feet. The curse says that Waspajan will claim the life of anyone who comes after his money. That he will kill them just like he was killed by them waspas. Ron explained. How did he die? Well, it goes like this. John was up in the mountains with a few cult folks sacrificing some poor virgin. But she broke free and ran. They chased her up a tree where she looked around for some way to get out. She found a wasp nest and broke the branch with it on it. The nest fell and landed on John's head. Waspers don't even need a reason to sting you, let alone having a head break through their home. They say his head was so swollen that it was the size of the nest when they broke it off him. Let me ask you something, how could a ghost kill someone with wasps? How many death curses have you had experience with? I guess you're right. Ron still seemed scared. Well, where are we gonna start digging? Ron had brought up the big question. Where would they begin? John wasn't buried with any grave marker, and only the members of his cult were allowed at the funeral. Even though the yard they entered was labeled a cemetery, there was no markers and John was the only one buried in it. They might just be here all night. The place was huge. I figure we start in the center and work our way out. We each dig a hole about six foot deep and repeat as necessary until we find it. Max had planned this out like a game of battleship. Man, we're gonna be here forever. Why don't we just rob a liquor store or something? This has less chance of us getting locked up. I also don't know of any liquor stores that keep gold bars. How do we even know he is buried with it? Ron was full of annoying questions tonight. You heard that fella in the bar. He used to be part of the cult. He was buried with it because they think he is supposed to take it over to the other side and then bring even more back with him when he rises again. Max recounted the tale he overheard at the bar. Some of the cultists were at the bar talking about it to each other. What if one of the cult members already took it? You heard them. They believe all that shit about him coming back. They wouldn't want to upset the dead bastard. Now dig. Max handed Ron a shovel. Hours went by as the two dug a few holes roughly six feet deep and a few feet across. Ron was growing weary and it showed. He stopped to have a cigarette. How do we explain the money? He asked. What do you mean? Max understood the question, but he wanted Ron to articulate. It was eerie at how quiet things were, and the talking seemed to help his nerves. Not that he believed in the curse, but he was curious if any cult members still came out here five years after John died. Say we do get the gold, how do we explain the way we acquired the sudden wealth? This was the first time Ron seemed almost optimistic about the whole idea. We wouldn't. We'd sell a bar or two in a pawn shop over in Wilton to get the funds to move. We're gonna get out of this shit town and start new lives in some place like Wisconsin. Wisconsin? Ron was puzzled. Hell yeah, Wisconsin. Max dug his shovel into the soil. Best cheese you could find. The temperature isn't dog shit either. I'm tired of humidity. My ass is a bigger swamp than the one we're in right now. Gross. I would like to try the cheese though. And isn't Seattle in Wisconsin? Yeah, sure. Max wasn't listening. His shovel had struck something hard. I think I found something, man. He dug his shovel down again and struck something solid. Yeah? You find it? I don't know. Come over here and help me. Whatever it is, it's big. You think his face will still be covered in waspish stings? Ron asked morbidly. It's been five years. I don't think he'll have a face at all anymore. They focused on digging, unearthing the giant box that lay buried beneath them. By the time the top was revealed, they knew they had found it. It wasn't an ordinary casket. The length was right, but the sides were wider. It was made for a really fat man two people, or a man with gold surrounding him. Who's gonna open it? Max asked, now suddenly aware of the curse. 
The casket was covered in runes and symbols of eldritch design. This was your idea, Max. You open it. Believe me now about the curse? No, just thought you wanted to show some balls for once. I'll open the goddamn thing. But those runes... Probably mean nothing. Max explained. Most cults just write shit they've seen on movies or TV. See that one at the top there? That was on Ghost Snappers. Max pointed at symbol he was sure he saw before, looking like a cross with an oval on the top. That's an ink. Ron surprised him with his knowledge. It's Egyptian. See? The cult was full of shit. He grasped the side of the lid and tugged. It wouldn't budge. The thing must be stuck, help me out. No way. I ain't gonna be got by no curse. Just help me shit brain, or I'll get the bigger cut. Ron grasped the side and together they still couldn't get it to budge. Must be welded shut, Ron said. What's that noise? I don't hear anything. Max listened closely. It sounds like waspers. Now you're being ridiculous. Ain't no wasps around here. Max began, but suddenly he thought he heard a mild buzzing. He shook his head and cleared his ears and the noise was gone. Hand me the crowbar. Ron proceeded out of the grave to get the crowbar. The sound of wasps had died down but Ron was watching over his shoulder. The crowbar wasn't in the bag. The crowbar isn't in here. Ron whispered down at Max. Did you check the bag? Of course I checked the bag. Where else would it have been in your ass? All right, all right. Max got out of the grave, making his way to the bag. He rummaged around in it. Not in the bag, huh? Max pulled out the crowbar with a smug smile. But I didn't it wasn't. Ron stammered, having swore he searched the whole bag. Whatever. I'm definitely getting 75% now. Max jumped back down in the grave. Ron searched the bag again, unsure how he missed it. Max went to work with the bar, placing the hook under the lid and prying at it. Still wouldn't budge. Frustrated, Max slammed the crowbar into the casket creating an indent. As the idea struck him Max yelled back to Ron. Hand me the axe. You got it. The axe was lowered down to Max taking the handle Max hoisted it over his head and brought it down hard on the lid. A loud whack echoed throughout the cemetery followed by another. The lid was chipping away with each lick when suddenly the axe struck metal. What kind of casket is this? Max lamented as his efforts were continually thwarted. Ron, hand me the dynamite. Really? Isn't that extreme? Yes. But this fucking coffin isn't what I'd call normal. The inside is lined in steel. He swung the axe down again, barely making a dent. Here you go. Ron handed him the sticks of dynamite. Max only needed one, he wanted to blow the lid off, not the coffin to pieces. He lay a stick down, and set the wick at a couple inches to give him time to get out. He struck a match, it went out. Then another. There was no wine down here. Have a zippo? These matches keep blowing out. He tossed the matchbook away. Yeah, I always got one. Ron handed him his lighter a stainless steel Zippo with an engraving of a cross. Max brought up the Zippo to the fuse and lit it, sparking up as Max hurriedly scrambled out of the grave. Ron and Max back far from the grave and waited for the boom. It seemed like forever as they waited, but no explosion occurred. What the hell? Max slowly crept toward the grave. As he inched closer to the edge he couldn't hear the fuse. Looking over into the grave he could see the dynamite was laying there bereft of a spark. The fuse was now only a nub. Max climbed down to inspect it and suddenly the fuse lit itself. Ron was there by then and was able to pull Max out of the grave in time before the whole damn thing blew up. Jesus Christ that was close. Max yelled as the debris flew down over their bodies splayed out on the ground. 
Ever seen dynamite do that before? Ron asked seriously. It's the curse. That's no curse, just bad dynamite. Max brushed himself off and stood himself up. Besides, wasn't the curse supposed to kill us with wasps? Max walked over to the grave and smiled. The casket was blown apart. Max couldn't see everything in it, but he saw something glinting in the lamplight. He leaped into the hole and began removing the rest of the debris. Ron got down to help him when he let out a scream. What? What is it? Max asked as Ron tore the dirt walls, trying to crawl out of the grave. Looking down at what Ron saw his heart skipped, and his instinct told him to jump out of his skin. Sitting amidst the gold bars wasn't a body, nor bones or dust. It was a wasp nest. It's a fucking wasp nest, Max. Ron's tears could be heard as he got himself up out of the hole. Ron, Max gathered himself. Ron, calm down. The nest is empty. The hell it is I heard the buzzing. He was further away from the sound of his voice. Max took a shovel and poked the brown wad of chewed wood that was once a wasp nest. Seriously, it's empty. Max grabbed the bulbous object and held it over his head. Why the hell isn't there a body? Ron cautiously walked back. Who cares? The gold's here, man. Look. He dropped the nest and turned back to look at the glorious riches. There must have been at least fifty bars stuffed in the coffin. Grab the bag, Ron. Ron handed Max the bag and he began stuffing it with the gold bars. Each one was heavy, denoting their value. This was the best thing to happen to Max in his life. A uh, Max? Ron called to Max who was too busy taking the gold to hear him. Max? He spoke louder until he had to shout. Max? What? What is it? Get down here and help me. He turned to see the color draining from Ron's face. Wah wah wasps. He gasped pointing at the nest. To Max's horror there was now a dozen wasps covering the nest. Max backed away as the nest began to bounce. A thick ichor started to pour out of the bottom, a black ooze that formed a puddle. The puddle began to grow and take shape, even more wasps were crawling on the nest now. Max was transfixed with the sight before him. More and more the ooze took shape, lifting the nest off the ground. It seemed like the mass was growing legs, as two supports were created for the nest that was now more wasp than nest. Max broke his gaze and began climbing up out of the shaft. Ron was already running out of the cemetery in horror-struck panic. Max couldn't resist the urge to turn and look again. The nest was now affixed atop a humanoid shape, including arms and legs. The shape had no clothes but was pitch black showing no detail. The wasps crawled up and down the body as the form lurched forward. Not fully complete, the movement was slow and methodical. Max's mind reeled in horror as he ran to catch up with Ron. They cleared the swamp and got back to Max's truck. Hopping in Max turned on the truck, his headlights came on revealing a fully dressed man standing in front of the truck, with a wasp nest for a head. Max floored it running over the monster as they tore out of the swamp as fast as they could. Peeling out onto a main road the two managed to collect their thoughts. Ron was the first to speak. Fuck that was Wasp John. Fuck 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 we are so screwed man. I ran over him, there's no way he could catch up to us. Fuck he's real? Max looked in the rear view to see if he was following. Nothing. He breathed heavy. They got all the way back to Max's trailer. The sun was beginning to rise and their fear was slowly creeping away. Something about sunlight made Un feel safe. Unlocking his door the pair made their way into the trailer. Ron made his way to the fridge to get a beer. Hey Max want a beer? No, get me too. Ron opened the fridge door and grabbed the beers. When he turned back to Max he dropped the beers. Max was laying on his couch, sprawled out and not moving. 
The closer Ron got he could see the vacant look in Max's eyes. Upon reaching him Ron saw the wasp crawling out of Max's mouth. Ron turned to run. Wasp John was standing behind him, making Ron scream. Thinking quick Ron dodged the grasp of John and ran to the entertainment center where Max kept his prized baseball bat signed by Mark McGuire. As Ron turned back Wasp John was gone. Looking around Ron tried to leave the house but as he opened the door Ron saw thousands of wasps on the glass of the storm door. He tried the windows but they were all covered too. Ron was freaking out, swinging the bat wildly at a few wasps that made their way into the house. No sign of Wasp John. Ron went to the kitchen and grabbed a bottle of whiskey. Opening it he placed the rag inside, he had a surprise for Wasp John. The buzzing now was intense, he heard it everywhere. Ron was going to make a break for it, just run through the door and out to safety when Wasp John made his appearance. A mass of wasps clumped together in front of the door to assemble the monster. Ron lit the bottle and threw it at John. The creature lit up, he thought he heard it screaming. The nest started to tear away, revealing the head underneath. It wasn't the face of a man, but that of a wasp. Its mandibles were as big as chef knives. Wasp John made his way to Ron, who was swinging the bat as he approached. The bat caught John in the side of his wasp head, knocking the flaming figure back. Ron took another swing when John grabbed the bat and pulled Ron in towards him. Ron caught on fire as John sunk his mandibles into his neck. When the fire department showed up there was nothing left of the trailer. No bodies were discovered. No one ever heard from Ron and Mark, but there was stories. Some people heard the commotion that morning when the trailer caught fire. Everyone who watched heard the terrible buzzing and the screams from inside. Everyone knew what had happened. Now no one enters that swamp anymore. For at night you can hear the wasps if you listen, and if you get close enough to where two grave robbers woke up Wasper John, you might just hear the screams too. The End <laughs>